and whisper praise into his ear holes, assuring him that he looks like a Greek god and all he needs is one good pump to beat Arnold. <laughs> it's only- <laughs> You know, Gorok sounds pretty awesome. So I might have made a slight mistake here. Essentially what happened was that I got Krokgar mixed up with Gorok, and while we were hyping up Krokgar so much, it turns out that the one in the free DLC is actually Gorok. It's not too big of a mistake, but I, I guess we just get the chance to learn about more lords from the game. But since this video is a little short, I might add in another lord at the end here. Uh, I don't know who just yet as I'm recording this, but yeah, let's see what Gorok's about. Welcome to a noob's guide to Gorok. This is Gorok, the great white lizard, Looks which badass. sounds like something you'd hear someone yell at a clan rally. But really, Gorok <laughs> is part of an elite organization within the Lizardmen that serves as Lord Croak's personal bodyguard and carries out mass slaughter of civilians in- Oh, uh, well. <laughs> oh man, only a few seconds in and we're already committing war crimes. Is that a mummified corpse of a slan mage? I think it, one of the slant mages just decided to not die. And so, oh yeah, that's right. You guys recommended I start out with Gorok because he starts off with like a super powerful unit alongside him, which like the other Lizardmen can also obtain this unit, but Gorok starts with him. I'm assuming it's going to be this guy. It serves as Lord Croak's personal bodyguard Lord and Croak? carries out mass slaughter of civilians and I think oversees the skink labor camps. No, wait, I'm sorry, that's the SS. Gorok is a Super Saurus warrior, and they're obviously different. See, Gorok was born Super to the elite Saurus. Saurus warrior cast of the Lizardmen, which in Princess Bride terms is the Fezzik to the Sland Vizini. But even among gotcha. giant fighters, Gorok was marked for greatness. When he emerged alone from his spawning pool, his pale white skin displaying his superiority over the other lizard men. And now he looks after these lesser beings, seeing it as his white lizard's burden to protect them and expects to be served and thanked for his patriarchal beneficence. Burden. So clearly Gorok isn't a racist. He's just a specious. <laughs> Gorok also happens to be the strongest Saurus alive, absorbing the other warriors in his proto womb so that now he has all the power of a giant Saurus warrior and several tad Poles. But when he emerged, the Slan priest Lord Croak saw in him the makings of a champion of the Lizard Man and asked Gorok the only question that matters. Gorok, what is best in life? To crush your enemies. To see them driven before you. And hear the lamentations of the Skaven. <laughs> and scantily clad skinks now tend to really every like as he sits motionless Skaven. atop Itza's tallest pyramid, while his attendants massage him with baby oil and whisper praise into his ear holes, assuring him that he looks like a Greek god and all he needs is one good pump to beat Arnold. <laughs> it's only. <laughs> You know, Gorok sounds pretty awesome. I mean, Kronkar was uh, pretty awesome too. That man's been alive and fought in so many different battles, but eh, Gorok's got something going on too. When Gorok is telepathically called to battle by a sland priest, that the cold-blooded purpose appears in his eye slits, what and then he's sent out here? like Ivan oh, Drogo from Rocky IV to break his opponents. The Great White Lizard has fought in countless battles, and his scarred albino body is a testament to a thousand yeah, triumphs where Gorok stood at the center of the battle line, his enemies unable to pierce his thick scales, so that he stands like a gore rock on which it's his enemies are broken. Hell yeah. Gorok is a fighting machine, a creature wholly purposed for war and the slaughtering of enemies, who lives by the mantra of never retreat, never surrender. Because in an alternate dimension, Galaxy Quest was a good film. Gorok's acclaim <laughs> seems to be not that he's a great fighter, but that he's nigh unkillable, having been run over by a chariot, poisoned, stabbed, shot, bitten, and lanced through the chest by a dark elf, the only thing really? they haven't tried is tossing his ass to drown in a river like Rasputin, but even then he'd just crawl out again because he's a lizard. In the game, this <laughs> Gorok the Highlander gets perfect vigor, physical resistance, terror, and regeneration to ensure that wherever you put him, he will stay there and not die. He fights with two unique items, the Mace of Ulamak and the Shield of Aeons. A massive slab of rock cut from the heart of a volcano and then carved Ooh. by generations of skinks just to give this one guy a shield. Because in communist Lustria, every lizard man is equally important. But while- <laughs> Oh, it's Gorok. 
So what I'm getting here in terms of power scaling that I know, apparently the corn lord, I forget his name. Was it like Scarbrand or something like that? He's like the best melee unit in the game, whereas Krokgar is like a, a very close second to him. I wonder where Gorok fits in there, because like from what I know, the three dudes... He's kind of coming in last, but apparently he's also quite tanky, which means that he's probably pretty good at just being a single unit to hold the line. If you can actually do that, they'd probably just go around him. <laughs> but maybe his unique items here can do uh, some cool things. Or Well, actually, no, he's got Lord Croak with him. Lord Croak probably has some really powerful magic. How the skinks work, Gorok leads, and especially suited to armies built around Saurus warriors, with a unique right Saurus that gives warriors. them the unbreak- Okay, actually, let me take a look at this. Initial challenge, easy. Oh uh, yeah, so that's why it's beginner friendly. Yeah, he starts with Lord Croak. Unbreakable and defense bonuses for Saurus. Don't know what unbreakable does. I guess they don't route? Recruit rank plus three for Saurus Scar veterans. I guess they just respect him, and so the veterans join. Rank. Recruitment rank. Perhaps, like, the units that you use, they level up. They rank up through each battle that you put them through. But with Gorok, you just get them plus three as if they'd been on, like, three battles. And upkeep minus 20%. Always nice. There's some race attributes, too. I guess all the Lizardmen would get this. Geomantic web. Boost the power of commandments. I think those are, like, the rights that you do to change the condition of things in your terrain, within your area of control. Okay, special spawnings, so we get uh, access to blessed variants of certain units, so they're just the same unit but more powerful. Be suitable for every task, though some are so ferocious they may lose control and charge ahead. Hmm. I guess maybe in the heat of battle, the Lizardmen would just go absolutely crazy and not listen to any of your orders as they like charge into the enemy and just try to eat everybody. I guess that makes sense. They are kind of like, what, slightly altered versions of the dinosaurs that roam the wilds. So there's like gonna be a, a little bit of that same natural instinct in them to just eat everything. I wonder if this is easier to manage than like the, the Skaven just fleeing from battle. Simply because their leadership is just incredibly low. Eh, I guess it depends on how you look at it. They flee from battle, so they have a chance to rally, but with your units going absolutely berserk, they charge into the enemy and potentially just die. Trade ...so that they never run, and defense bonuses, as well as lower upkeep costs and extra ranks for Scar veterans, making the most versatile units in the Lizardman roster even more indispensable. And since he Most starts in the still, middle of okay. Illustria that looks like 1980s New York, he and his warriors will be under constant attack as they bop their way back to Coney Itza Island, which is why he gets bonuses to melee defense in his own territory and 20% physical resistance when defending sieges. Because, you know, he's the shield guy. He's, he's defensive oriented. I mean, this is okay. pretty straight. Okay, gotcha. But none of that Defense really oriented. matters because Gorok starts his campaign with Lord Croak available at turn one. The most ridiculously OP Lord ever created by CA. Normally, you have to really? wait until level 15 to unlock this monster. And it oh. makes this campaign go from easy to easy peasy lemon squeezy. As all you have to do to win any battle is have Gorok stand there while Croak glasses them from orbit, turning any <laughs> opponents into pools of unidentifiable- what? I need to see that again. As all you have to do to win any battle is have Gorok stand there while Dude, Croak glasses them gone. from orbit, turning any opponents into pools of unidentifiable red jelly. Gorok. That I guess they then feed to Gorok afterwards, because seriously, what do these guys eat? I mean, it's an entire civilization of giant carnivorous dinosaurs, but there's not one food bill. But after the battles, Gorok returns to his not as strong as they throne claw, and strikes his best Conan the Barbarian but pose, definitely more hibernating again until he is called upon to defend his people. But is Gorok really the character for you to play? Well, if you like the idea of a Saurus version of powder that can always be found where the fighting is thickest, an immovable object that fells enemies with powerful sweeps of his mighty weapon, or, you know, smashes mm. them to bits on his massive shield and then crushes them beneath his tread, then this is your man, Lizard, Lizard Man. And honestly, if that fails, you can always just have him stand there and not die while Lord Croak does all the work. Okay, 
I mean, I, I can see the strat here. You just get a bunch of enemies to surround him to attempt to take him down, and then you just use Lord Croak to nuke everything around him. Oh, oh well, I mean, you also nuke Gorok in the same process, but like, he could probably take the damage, whereas everybody else can't. His kit does sound more suited to my style of gameplay, simply because I usually play tanks whenever I play like an MMO, if it's an MMO with a triangle-like system. But I always like playing tankier characters. One, because, well, my reaction time is absolute ass, but uh, <laughs> two, because I just enjoy the, the gameplay style. So while Gorok doesn't exactly have the hand of God and he shoots laser beams out of it, he can still do pretty cool things. And I think once I get through the tutorial, he'll definitely be the first Lord that I play. And now it's time to see what Ikid Claw can do. I've seen his gameplay after watching the Grim Cleepers video on Ikid Claw. So I know this guy throws around nukes and he usually does more damage to his own troops than the enemy, but I mean, it, it works on in the end, simply because of how the Skaven are. I think this guy is in, like, paid DLC, and unfortunately I don't have the funds for that, but maybe someday we'll get to try him out, and I'd be interested in trying him for sure. Welcome to a noob's guide to Ikit Claw. This is Ikit Claw. He's a Skaven, hmm. who are far less cool than the Skaven. They listen to weird music, wear matching suits, <laughs> and come with free fedoras. Everyone gotcha. hates Ikit Claw. Everyone. Every turn will bring Research you a new person 20. you've never met just to tell you how much they hate you, just like the internet. See, Ikit here is a bit of a mad scientist, like an evil rat version of Dr. Oppenheimer, and wants nothing more than to create fun toys to glass the surface world in the name of the horned rat. That As the head really of Clan Scryer, Ikit Claw is a lord guaranteed to reignite the debate on the word nuclear. Mission accomplished <laughs> indeed. <laughs> In the Vortex campaign, Ikit starts shoehorned into an already overcrowded Lustria. At this point, it's a knife fight to even find a parking spot down there. I mean, you might as well name it Brooklyn. Instead, you should play the Mortal Empires map, which puts Clan Scryer where they're supposed to be in Skaven Blight. It even has a unique landmark that gives easy access to Clan Rats, Gisales, and Rattling Gunners. You know, everything a growing warlock engineer needs to run Raw Dog over the world of the Man Things. But you'll want to find something to do between turns they can run a bit long. Try reading War and Peace, oh, really? or take up knitting, or write silly War internet videos, peace. a desperate ploy for attention. The quest for Ikit Claw's first item takes him into the heart of Lustria to fight the Lizardmen. It makes sense for these quests to be there for the Eye of the Vortex campaign, but for Mortal Empires, they're on the ass end of the world, and it takes care- mm. Yeah, I don't really know about any of these campaigns, so I can't speak on this. But it does look like you just- Kind of get screwed over if you go with the the other campaign. Kind of an issue when, like, you have so many different factions now. You just kind of have to shoehorn people in into random spots, so you just kind of get screwed over. But, I mean, with a game with this many factions and this many systems, it's pretty much impossible to balance. ...characters so long to get there that I forgot that I even sent them in the first place. You know, like a true Skaven. It's also equally possible that Creative Assembly just really hates lizard men. The other DLC lord in this pack is called Teeny Weenie, after all. Like every great <laughs> empire, Ikit Claws runs on food and warp fuel. The best source of both is, shockingly, Battles. The game is called Total War Warhammer after all. Every other Shocking. faction on the map, including your own, exists solely to supply you with that sweet, sweet green nectar. Afterwards, you'll have a random chance of finding more warp fuel to add to your little lab of horrors. I'll admit that I'm still not exactly clear on what warp fuel really is. Warp stone is the crystallized essence of pure chaos and is used by Skaven for all sorts of things. But the only way mm -hmm. you would get it in a liquid form, I mean from a battlefield, would be to round up all the dead bodies and press them in a giant lemon squeeze. Or, or maybe a blender, oh, but then you'd need to God. boil it down into a goopy distillation process that must have incredibly high failure rates because I never seem to find the damn stuff after a battle, and I need it, you know, for rat science purposes. You'll use the fuel in Ikit's Forbidden Workshop, a mechanic that plays the same in both campaigns, and is really the standout feature on the Skaven side of the DLC. You use it to buff already ridiculously overpowered units so they lay down more spray than Peter North in a fireman's outfit. 
But what really sets Ickit's campaign apart are his Warp Storm Doom Rockets. They're tactical yeah, nukes you can Jesus. fire in battle, an idea the United States toyed with during the Cold War with the Davy Crockett delivery system. Because nothing says King of the Wild Frontier like wiping it from existence. You pay for more rockets with food and warp fuel. Dude, and yeah. As I was saying, Ickit Claw would be so good in these kind of siege battles since like all your enemies are just grouped up trying to defend the walls. You just nuke it. Like, how do you even defend against that? And Cody was also talking about how his research lab just buffs already powerful units. Are the Skaven just a little overtuned? Is that what's going on? And you can only stockpile a few at a time. But that's not a problem, okay. as you can only use one per battle, because CA oh. is allergic to fun. Using them is relatively straightforward. <laughs> you build them, you shoot them, you blow them oh up. My I mean, God. they first made these things in Tennessee, so it's not exactly rocket science. Well, actually, it is. And the door's wide open. <laughs> you don't need no battering ram, no giant monster to try and smack it down. You just nuke it, and then everybody charges in. It is rocket science, but who's splitting atoms? And Ickit's newfound power plays with the Skaven under Empire mechanic. You can attack a city and choose not to raise or loot it, but instead establish a secret Skaven stronghold in which Ickit can build a top secret doom sphere, a warpstone bomb that raises any city to the ground. Except that's back asswards. If I wanted to raise a city, I could have clicked that when I took it, instead of having to wait 15 turns and spend 5,000 gold to do the exact same damn thing. Yeah. Thankfully, CA is staffed um, with mad geniuses, who gave the Under Empire a chance to spread to surrounding cities every turn, so you can secretly establish oh. your own subterranean nation without ever having to scurry out of your starting hovel. You have the option to create buildings that give food, Hell growth, yeah and campaign bonuses to movement and recruitment, but each comes with an attached detection increase that raises a bar next to your cove. Push it to the limit, and you're found out. But there's no cutscene or anything. It's just a message that pops up saying that the host nation can spend gold to oust you. And if they do, you'll come back from an intern to find your nest has disappeared. And that's it. I I'm not sure what I was expecting to happen here, but it was more than that, which left me not expecting much from the Doomsphere detonation either. So when I tried it beneath a dwarf stronghold, well... Yeah, we saw this. That is satisfying. The Under Empire isn't exactly a nuanced mechanic, but it's functional in a way my crippling anxiety can only dream of. It leaves you feeling like a furry cancer, waiting to consume the world. As the eponymous Warlock Engineer of the Warlock and the Prophet DLC, Ikit brings much needed units to the Skaven and packs a bevy of ranged and armor piercing units that plug more holes in the Skaven roster than fill Swift with flex tape. For the true Ikit Claw thematic army experience, you'll want to start with three parts Warplock Gisales. Sniper Rats, who whittle down enemy lords from insanely long range Sniper with such rats. unerring accuracy they're bound to be nerfed in the next patch. And if for some reason enemy missile troops did find a way past their ridiculousness, the Gisales can depend on the shields they carry to absorb most of that damage too. Couple that with armor-piercing bullets, and longtime Total War players will start getting flashbacks to the other ungodly abomination from the depths of Margaret Thatcher's pleasure drawer, the Meonese Pavis Crossbowmen. Their Dark Masters may have given them a new name, but the taint of their game. evil is instantly recognizable here. If by some miracle of mass sacrifice, you do happen to get past the Gisales to the Skaven lines, well, <laughs> Ikit has a multi-barreled surprise waiting for you. Rattling yeah. Gunners. Take everything we love about Gatling guns and Fall of the Samurai and bring it to Warhammer. Except for the manual aiming, they didn't bring that, but you know. Yeah. And if there's one thing action movies have taught me, it's that Gatling guns can solve any problem. <laughs> Apparently, there's some sort of upgrade that you can do with the Gatling guns to make them have infinite ammo. So, like, if you're able to set them up in such a good position that your enemy has to maybe, like, charge uphill to get to you, then, yeah, yeah, there's, uh, really no coming back from that. The only way that we saw, like, the enemy circumventing that was the fact that they just had regeneration that outpaced the amount of DPS they could put out. But I don't know if that's going to be, like a problem on the normal difficulties or if it's just only a thing on the much higher 
campaign difficulties. And with the rattling gun suppression mechanic, enemy speed is reduced to a turtle pace and leaves them wide open to the new Doom Flayers. Small, fast, armor-piercing chariots that look straight out of Fury Road. Witness me. Right. And are basically buzzsaw motorcycles. I'm honestly not even sure I can legally show them in this video without putting up a Brazzers logo first. Because once they get in the back door, they just pound away. And that army is limping My. up. Because when you're talking about man-sized sewer rats, your mind's always in the gutter. To round out your army, add two warp lightning cannons to the back line, and then fill the rest of your slots with your favorite flavor of meat shield to make it the true Ickit Claw special. Yeah, right. With this build, you can down giants, tree men, pointy ears, stunties, scaly boys, and even surrender monkeys, and teach them all the true meaning of shock and That's a awe. Sniper. Ickit Claw's campaign is the That's most awesome. fun I've had playing Warhammer 2. If I had really? to rate Ickit Claw as a Skaven Lord, with the top end being the rats that brought the bubonic plague to Europe, and the bottom that weird kid in your class that had a pet rat who always smelled of urine, Ickit Claw would be the explosive rats engineered in World War II to fight the Nazis. You'll spend your entire campaign doing everything with nuclear. <laughs> that was a thing, was it? <laughs> there are desperate times calls for desperate measures. But that's actually kind of exciting. The fact that Cody is like, oh, it's the most fun that he's ever had playing Total War Warhammer 2. A good claw does sound like a lot of fun. Just go in, do all your mad scientist experiments and blow shit up. Bullets, spamming warp lightning, and blowing it all to kingdom come. His campaign is only hampered by some questionably long timers that try to limit how often you smile from ear to ear. I can only assume this is because the British have jacked up teeth and have to keep grins to a minimum, <laughs> as Ickit Claw elevates mass destruction to an art form so fine, it can only be expressed through Tchaikovsky. constant torrent of damage. I would not want to be up against Ikid Claw in any battle. Thanks for watching. And if you enjoyed this video, use your free will as a human and decide how to act on that, because you shouldn't take <laughs> orders from people on YouTube. Have a nice time. Hell yeah, dude. <laughs>It's a bit unfortunate that you can only use like one nuke per battle, but I suppose they had to limit the amount of fun you had or else you know, everybody would just play Aked Claw, because that is very, very OP, especially for breaking through strategic points. In the previous video, we saw that Lord Croak also kind of had something similar, but I don't know if it has the same destructive power in-game as the nukes that Aked Claw uses. But definitely looks like a lot of fun, and I'm looking forward to maybe someday trying out Aked Claw for myself. But honestly, just seeing the man in action is already a work of art. <laughs> Do I kill my own guy? <laughs> Your unit will die next turn anyway. True, Alex? Damn, that's kind of brutal, though. Hey, I'm the commander here.